And so here's one of those 52 days out of each year where we get to come together in the name of Jesus and present ourselves to the altar of God as they did in the book of Revelation, to bring our sacrifices, our offerings of praise and sacrifices to offer ourselves and to receive from the Holy Spirit a word of instruction or encouragement and for us to do that together so that we are formed more in love together. And all of this was his idea from the beginning of time. And here we are, experiencing it and living in it. Now, if you just was like, I'm going to go attend a service, you're in the wrong place. There's a whole lot more going on here than just attending. Well, let's take a moment then. Because without him, we can't do anything. Dolores, would you ask the Lord's blessing? Chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. This is where we'll we'll be uh, putting most of our focus today, but um, I want to uh, take a moment and kind of set the stage with some broad brush strokes of what God had been doing in the world between, let's say, the ascension of Jesus and the events we're going to see in Acts chapter 13. So this is just going to be a real brief overview to remind you that Jesus, before he ascended, commanded his disciples, go into Jerusalem and wait. And so they did. And at the time of the Passover feast, there were Jewish people from all over the Mediterranean world that were gathered in Jerusalem. They were there for the feast. Their home is in Rome or Alexandria in North Africa, or Ephesus, or Corinth. All over the world, they came to Jerusalem. And as they were gathered there, as promised in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit poured out on the 120 that were gathered in the upper room. These were followers of Jesus. Listen to this word, because we're going to come back to this word later. Believers in him. And as that poured out on them, they began to miraculously speak in different languages. And suddenly, they were proclaiming a gospel that the world had never heard. It had been hinted of, but the world had never heard it. And it was proclaimed to Jewish people from all over the world. And it was a proclamation that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, and their Savior and King, who they had been waiting for. And as that word of God fell on the audience that was listening, a multitude came to put their belief in the Jesus that was being proclaimed. And they went back to all of those cities across the world. It was like one of those uh, Roman rockets going off. Here is the gospel message, and all of these sparks covered the known world. Individuals, not all who heard, believed. So a spark landed here, and a spark landed here, and a spark landed here. But there was such a spiritual drought across the world that makes our southwestern drought look like nothing. The whole world was tender. And when the word of God fell in each one of those cities, people put their belief, their trust in Jesus through that gospel. Now, there were some surprises that God had not told or had not revealed clearly ahead of time. He had hinted. He kind of said, you know what? Guys, I'm going to give tell, leave you some little clues. But nobody's going to get it until I pull it out and show it to you. Until I reveal to you what I have intended. And so we find in Acts chapter 10 that Cornelius, who is called a God-fearer, he's a Roman official, 
who believes, when they say God-fearer, it's someone who believes in the God of the Jews. She had three classifications of people when it comes to Judaism. You had the Jews who were born as Jews. They were, they were born into that nation. They believed or they didn't believe. It didn't matter. They were, they were Jews. And then you had proselytes. These were Gentiles, born Gentiles, who having heard from Abraham's seed about this one true God named Yahweh, they left their pagan beliefs and they came to put and believe that there is one true God and they wanted to become a Jew. And so they were going through a process so that they could join Jewish people in the temple worship and they could be part of that nation. They were immigrating. And then you had others who were Gentiles, who heard about this one true God, and they came to believe in him, but they were going to stay with their nationality. But they worshipped him, and they put away their pagan gods. They were called the God-fearers. Cornelius was one of those, and no one anticipated what was going to happen. God chose one of those God-fearers to reveal to the brand new church of the Jewish nation that salvation was not for the Jew only, but that he had always intended to be the savior of the entire world. And the Spirit of God poured out on Cornelius and his household exactly the same way that it poured out on the 120 on the day of Pentecost. And by doing that, God proclaimed to his church, here is a truth. The Gentiles also are included in salvation. By the way, as a Gentile, may I just say, oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for God so loved the world. Hmm. Now, when we begin in the book, in chapter 13, we find there's this church in Antioch. And what had happened was that although in chapter 10 and chapter 11, God has made it known that salvation is to the Gentiles as well, we find that as the Jewish believers were traveling to various cities, they only preached to Jewish people, except in Antioch. If you look back to chapter 12, let's see if I can find it here. Let's look in verse um, 19. I'm sorry, chapter 11, verse 19. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. Uh, you know what? Um, can you go ahead and put the map up for me, please? Word of God, when Stephen was persecuted, the Christians scattered from Jerusalem because Paul began killing him. And so the word of God with that scattering went up to the Sidon, Tyre and Sidon, the Phoenician area, and then it went up here to Antioch, which technically is in Syria, not even in Israel. And it says here, uh, as far as Antioch, speaking to the word to no one except the Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene. Here's Cyprus. These were Jewish people who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover. And whatever way, they had received Christ as their Savior, and evidently they didn't get the memo that we're only supposed to preach to the Jews. Or they were rebellious don't know. But when they got to Antioch, they not only preached to the Jews that were living there in the synagogue, but they began preaching to the Gentiles as well. And the word of God there called the people out of that city into salvation and formed a local congregation. And when those in Jerusalem heard about it, the leaders of the church in Jerusalem heard this, they sent Barnabas and they sent some other men from their church up to Antioch to minister and Barnabas, when he saw the great work that was taking place, not only in the Jewish realm, but in the Gentile realm as well, 
he ran up here to Tarsus, where Paul had been kind of sitting and simmering, trying to win his hometown and the area north of it to Jesus, being beaten, being uh, cast out of his family, not, nothing really happening in his ministry. Barnabas comes up and gets him and says, come with me to Antioch. I need help. And Paul and Barnabas begin to just be servants in Antioch. And that brings us to chapter 13. Now there were in the church of Antioch prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, a lifelong friend of Herod, the patriarch, and Saul. Prophets and teachers. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, who said? The Holy Spirit said. While they were worshiping and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Now, let me just show you where they go and what they do. Put the map back up, please. So, remember that Barnabas is from Cyprus. So Barnabas says to Paul, you know what? The word of God is already in Cyprus a little bit. Let's go to Cyprus, which is here, and let's, let's share the gospel there. So they leave the seaport here and they come to Salamis and they share the gospel there. A little bit of effect. They come down to Paphos and this is where the capital is. And there's a proconsul there, a Roman proconsul, who is a great man in the Roman Empire. He is retired, and they gave him Cyprus as his retirement gift. Some get a watch. In Rome, you get nations. So this proconsul has a Jewish magician in his court. A Jewish magician. Do you guys remember the story about later on in the book of Acts where uh, they're in Ephesus, and it says that these guys uh, tried to cast out a demon, and they said, uh, you know, we're casting out this demon in the name of Jesus that Paul teaches, and the demon whooped them. Those were itinerant Jewish magicians. There were Jewish people who went around the world as con artists. And they were peddling the word of God for a prophet. By the way, in the Christian church, immediately the same thing happened. Well, there's a Jewish magician there in the court of this proconsul, and the proconsul is very impressed with him. And Paul is trying to tell this Roman proconsul, this mighty man of Rome, about Jesus, and the Jewish magician keeps getting in the way. And so Paul says, be blind. And he was. And when the proconsul saw that, here he had been with someone who could do some tricks. But with Paul, it was simply a spoken word, and the proconsul immediately said, Tell me about this God who you serve, because I believe. Now, here's what's interesting they leave there, and they head to a place that no one would go to. This up here is right on the border. It's a frontier town next to a third world. A frontier town? Very much so. It's the end, the very end of the Roman Empire. It's wild. In fact, to get from the Mediterranean Sea in Perga, to get to here, the journey was one that was filled with bandits, diseases. The only place where you could stop to stay were inns that were actually brothels. It was, it was, who would go there? But here's what we find out from archaeology. We found this proconsul's name up here. I didn't find it. An archaeologist found it. Up here that it's his hometown. And while he was alive, his sister was living there. When he received the gospel message, he said, Paul, 
go tell my sister. Well, John Mark abandons them right here in Perga as he sees the journey ahead through Pamphylia and then this treacherous mountain pass right here. He leaves and Paul and Barnabas arrive here. Now remember, they started in Antioch in Syria, and now they're in Antioch, Pisidia. So when you're reading scriptures, remember there's two Antiochs, okay? And this region, this entire region, is known as Galatia. The book of Galatians is written to the Christians here, and Iconium, and Derbe, and Perga. I think we can drop the map now. Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 13. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. Now let us picture this for a moment. They went into the synagogue as a traveling Jewish person, sat down in the back. In the synagogue are Jews by birth. There are proselytes who are going through the process. And there are God-fearing Gentiles who believe in God and want to hear the word of God. They're all in the synagogue. The synagogue is not like the temple. You could have God-fearers come in. So that's who's in there. So they went and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, now this is done every Sabbath in the synagogue, someone reads the word of God. Remember they brought Jesus, the scroll from Isaiah. Someone's going to read the word of God. Do not neglect the public reading of the word of God, Paul says to young Timothy. If, have you ever wondered why we gather together in a room like this with pews or chairs like this and one person up front? Do you know where we got that from? Synagogue. That's where it comes from. Sometimes people ask, you know, they, they'll say like, is this really what God wants? Did he want one person talking and the rest listening? Well, that tends to be how he does it. <clears throat> That's not the way I would do it. But he gets to do what he wants. So we've been doing this just like they did there. The people of God gathered together and the word of God read. An exhortation given. And then discussion takes place. So after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. They don't know they're missionaries. They just think that they're Jewish travelers. They don't know that these are missionaries, evangelists of the crucified and risen Savior. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, ready? Men of Israel and you who fear God. Do you see why I keep talking about God fearing? That's there. He's addressing Jews and Gentiles in the synagogue. Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. This is a Jew talking to Jews. He made us great in slavery and he put up with us. For 40 years. Now, in some translations, instead of put up with, it'll say sustained us. Okay? And it says, um, after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. 
And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Paul's doing well. He's saying the same sermon that they hear Sabbath after Sabbath. Everything's good. Oh, yes, he agrees with us. We were in slavery. God brought us out with his mighty hand. He carried us through the wilderness. He killed seven nations and gave us this land that we don't live in anymore. But he gave it to us and our people. And when the people asked for a king, he gave them David. Everything is good. There is David. But then Paul goes from Old Testament to suddenly New Revelation and New Testament. From David's seed, it had been promised that there would be a Savior. And now Paul, as a Christian, says, I'm here to proclaim to you the Savior has come and his name is Jesus. Well, what evidence do you have, Paul? Can you imagine the hush in the synagogue? Wait. Let me see if I understand what you're saying, Paul. And we've heard lots of traveling Jewish magicians bring various myths around. Are you saying, Paul, that what we have waited for generation after generation, which is absolutely going to transform the face of the planet. Are you telling me that it's happening right now in our day? That's hard to swallow. Because it's going to change everything that I'm familiar with. But guess what? That is exactly what Paul was saying. Notice how he says it. I just, I'm fascinated by this. He says, before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. Everybody knew and accepted John the Baptist. His fame covered the Jewish world from end to end. He came and everybody knew that he was preaching in the power of Elijah. There was none like him. Everyone accepted it. Let me say this about John. If he had not been killed by Herod, the question was asked, would he have been crucified? Well, as long as John stayed in the wilderness preaching to the poor, the Pharisees would go out and check on him once in a while. But what Jesus did was he took the message of sin and repentance and walked right into the temple and proclaimed John's, John's message right there. Well, what Paul is saying to them is, he's saying, you all know John. Even, even the Pharisees, when they were asking Jesus, by what authority do you do this right here in our temple? By what authority? Jesus immediately refers to John. And he says this. What authority did John have? And they knew better than to say, well, his authority came from men because the entire Jewish nation would have stoned them on the spot. Everyone, everyone knew John the Baptist came from God. Now, here's the amazing thing. He never did a miracle. He never performed one miracle. But the power of his speech, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, cut through everything. And one day, this man that Jesus proclaimed was greater than every Old Testament prophet this man stood, and basically it goes like this. You all think that I am high and exalted. You look at me, you hear my words, and you say, here is the prophet of God. And then John said this. There is one right now in your midst that is so far above me that I'm not worthy to touch his shoelace. 
If you think I'm something, I am proclaiming to you right now there is one off the charts. Jesus had John's testimony. Jesus talks about that. He says, there is one who testifies about me. Not that I need any man's testimony. The works that I do testify about me, but John the Baptist, accepted by all as a prophet of God, whether loved or hated, proclaimed Jesus. And Paul comes and says, in verse 25, and as John was finishing his course, he said, what do you suppose I am? I'm not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I'm not worthy to untie. Friends, that's Jesus. High and lifted up. No one, no one, no one can ever compare to him. The best that mankind can offer is nothing compared to his exalted status, Jesus. Now listen, remember I said there was a word I wanted you to remember. The word was believe. Do you believe that? That's the gospel. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe he is the Savior? Do you believe he is God's anointed one? Verse 26. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God. Do you see that? Sons of the family of Abraham, Jews, and those of you among you who fear God. God fears. To us has been sent the messages of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. Okay, boys, you just read the prophets again. And every Sabbath for millennial, we have done this. And those, those words that we have read, from God's inspired lips have been proclaiming that the Messiah would come, would be crucified, not just killed, would be crucified, and would be laid in a tomb. You have read those words. And the, your leaders in Jerusalem read those words year after year. And I, Pharisee of Pharisees, read those words year after year. And we didn't understand it. And so by our misunderstanding, he used that to fulfill the very words we misunderstood. We killed him. Why? Because that was God's will. That was the plan. He says, and though they found in him no guilt, verse 28, worthy of death. They found in him no guilt, worthy of death. They asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, when they had carried out what they had read, when they had carried out that he would be mocked and beaten, when they had carried out that his clothing would be gambled over, when they had carried out what had been written, that his back would carry these stripes, that his flesh would be peeled, when they carried out that his hands would be pierced, when they fulfilled all of the prophecies, they laid him in a grave. But God raised him from the dead. <laughs> I love Paul's preaching. Now, it's going to get him in trouble. Okay, but we can enjoy it right now. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days, he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. 
And we bring you good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, get this, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessing of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. Every human that has been laid in the grave within a few hours, they begin to decompose. But not him. He is so exalted. So exalted, he, he is God of gods, that when they lay him in the grave, not one molecule began to fall apart. God preserved every single molecule of his body until he rose from the dead, and he will never see corruption. There is none like him. Do you believe that? There's none like him. John proclaimed it. The Father proved it by his resurrection from the dead. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Does he have the power to forgive every sin, this high and exalted one? Do you believe in him? Do you see? Do you believe in him? This one, that corruption can't touch his body, is certainly going to be able to cleanse me of all of my corruption. Come, let us reason together, though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. And by him everyone who believes is free. My body is going to see corruption and decay. <laughs> and then it will be gathered together like his. And it will never see it again. I'm free from death. And I'm freed from sin because of him. We're freed from everything, he says, from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Whoa, hang on a minute, Paul. You just mentioned the scriptures that we have read every Sabbath for millennia. And in these scriptures, we are given a law that is to be kept. And Paul is saying, the old order is gone. The old is fading away. And the new order is coming, an order that had been foreseen, for, uh, proclaimed, and foreknown, foreplanned. When he gave that old law, he had always looked to this day when the old would go and a right standing with God would be a free gift given by grace through faith. And you have read those Old Testament passages year after year, and you didn't understand them, but I'm here now to proclaim to you. He says, this is true. Now, I love this. He says, now, now here's a warning. Look, you scoffers. Be astounded and perish, for I'm doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. Huh? <laughs> This is God's word to a people. It's God's word in the Old Testament to the people Paul's talking to in New Testament days. 
Paul is saying, be very careful now that I have proclaimed this to you. Just because it's a work that has never been done, just because it's going to transform the entire planet right now in your, in your days, don't let that cause you to say, well, I just can't believe it. The world has gone on like this. We've sat down in this synagogue year after year. We've read these scriptures and suddenly you're telling me that God is changing everything in a moment. And God goes, that's what I'm saying. And some of you won't believe. You'll think that it can't happen. You'll think it's an imagination. You'll think the world's going to keep on and keep on and keep on and nothing's going to change. You'll think that this status quo is going to continue on and nothing's ever going to bring it to an end. Whether the preacher stands and preaches that the day of the Lord is coming and that fire is going to consume everything, you'll get a little thrill up your leg, but you'll think it can never happen in my day. Be careful, you scoffers. Can't you see the fire burning around you? Don't you see the evidence? Are you thinking that God cannot change the world in a second? You read these scriptures every day. And these scriptures proclaim that there is an end of days. Don't be thinking well, you know what, they were preaching that when I was a kid and it didn't happen, and so I'm just going to figure it's just going to go on and on and on, and, 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 you know, things will just get better, and eventually the kingdom will be here. No, it doesn't come like that. It comes with a trumpet. It comes with an end of all things. It comes with fire from heaven. It comes with the judgment of God. It comes with the flowing of blood to the, the height of a bridal. Is there any difference between what Paul was preaching about a Christ and a Savior and what we preach about the end of days? I love verse 42. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told to them next Sabbath. Oh. First of all, how precious are the feet of those who bear good news, but oh, how beautiful the ears of those who hear. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism. Many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. There's the gospel, friends. Jesus. We sang Jesus, Jesus. In each song, we sang louder and louder about this one who was preached. He is your Savior. He is your God. He is your sovereign King. And what do you have to do with this world today? You are nothing but a witness and a testimony here to him. He has freed you. You're not like anyone else. Verse 49, And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. Now, there's a passage of Scripture in Luke that I want us to take a look at. Put it up here on the screen. These are the words of Jesus. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Woe to you when people speak well of you, 
for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Not to the prophets, their fathers did to the false prophets. False prophet comes, everybody says, we like him. Wow, there's, now there's a guy preaching. I like to hear him preach. He never makes my toes curl. I love to hear him preach. He smiles. They speak very well of the false prophets. Woe to you when men speak well of you. Why do I point this out? As Paul is bringing the gospel, there is a response of people with ears who want to hear but immediately what breaks out is persecution. All through the New Testament, that is the norm. And we have been living in a very abnormal environment, and it's going to crush us when it changes. And scoffers don't be saying it can't happen in your day. It's already happened. Do you not see the fire on the horizon? John the Baptist, when he spoke of the fire, says, how I wish it were already kindled. Because the environment that we live in, where everyone speaks well of us, is poison to the church. We will never be, we will never stand in the flames and glow until there are flames. The normal environment all over the world throughout all of history is that God's people are persecuted. I had a dream last night. In my dream, my wife and myself and my three sons were on vacation. My sons in the dream were like high school age. And we were in a building, and I could see blocks away. We were in a large city, and blocks away I could see an apartment building on fire and the flames going up. And I dialed 911, and I said, there is a fire in an apartment building over there. And she said, you keep calling and giving us these false reports. Now, we're tired of it. And I'm like, I've never called you before. And they're going, no, you're the guy. We know you're the one. You keep on saying something's on fire. We rush out there. There's nothing there. And you know, you're going to get in trouble for this. Well, I got very actively involved in trying to prove her wrong. Can't you hear the, 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 the fire crackling? It's not me. Listen to my voice. I'm not the one who did it. I'm trying to tell you. I'm new in town. I'm arguing with her. No, no, there's no fire. There's no fire. And I saw the apartment building collapse and could hear the screams and the flames jump to the next building in my dream and I'm talking to this woman and then finally fire trucks come but by that time the whole city is a fireball and the firemen and the trucks had to pull back and now it's across the street and so I look at my wife my children and I say grab your things throw them in the car we've got to get out of here and we're scrambling trying to grab a hold of stuff we're on vacation you know duffel bags with suitcases and everything and 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 I, I went downstairs loading the car and then I came back up and the smoke was rolling across the ceiling and I could feel the heat of the flames on my body and my wife was there and my kids and I'm going we've got to hurry we've got to get out of here just throw your stuff in the car and then I'm going oh, I can't find the keys. And finally I reached in and I found the keys. And as I turned towards the car, everything collapsed and we perished. I woke up. Oh, what a dream. What a dream. And I got up and I went into the bathroom and I got a drink of water and I'm coming back. In an instant, the Lord changed everything. And this was no longer about a dream, but he was saying, what does it mean? I'm talking to you, Randy. What does it mean? 
I wasted 20 minutes trying to win an argument. I wasn't even trying to get the fire trucks there. I was just mad that this civil servant wouldn't listen to me, and I wasted 20 minutes arguing with someone who wouldn't listen. Why didn't I just hang up the phone, dial again, and get another operator? And the Church of Jesus Christ is arguing and arguing and arguing, and the word of the danger is not being communicated. Now, that's the trick of our adversary. He's got you on the line with someone who won't listen. This is why when Paul and Barnabas leave Antioch, Pisidia, in the next days, they knock the dust off of their feet and go to Iconium, where maybe the 911 lady will listen. So that was lesson number one. I wasn't even trying to convince her for the sake of saving lives. I just didn't like being doubted by a civil servant. Lesson number two. Why didn't we just leave the stuff behind? Why didn't we just walk out the back door? Why did we have to gather our stuff and try to save the car and our stuff? In that, we perished. the book of Genesis, when God rained fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. And remember that Lot is running away, and his wife turns back to look. And this is the first time I'd ever had a different view of that. I always thought, well, she was enamored with the thing, so he struck her because she was enamored. With this dream, it was destruction is coming so quickly that if I pause for a second, I need to run as fast as I can, because when that building comes down, the flames are going to come shooting out. I can't even turn to look or it will catch me. Can you see the fire on the horizon, friend? The greatest, most wonderful, most freeing moment of your life will be the day you drop all of your possessions and leave them behind and get clear. And all of a sudden you'll be going, I'm so glad that stuff got burnt up. The last lesson there was no one would believe that that magnitude of event could happen in their city. And it's been that way over and over and over throughout history. It can happen, and it will happen. And can you see the fire on the horizons closing in? Well, what do we do? This is what I asked him. What do we do? How high is Jesus? Do you believe in him? Can he take care of me? I think I will attach all of my thoughts of safety and perseverance and survival on him. I think I'll ask him, Lord, Save me and my family. I think I will hang up with the 911 operator and I will dial again and get another operator and share the word of the danger with her as a preacher. I'm going to preach and preach and preach and preach. The day of the Lord is coming. And if you don't hear it's okay, I'll say it again. And I'll say to someone else, I'll say to someone. And then finally, remember that my family was there. If I had simply made the decision to say, 
none of that stuff matters. Run. I and my family would have been saved. I'm going to do all I can to prepare this church for what's coming. This Wednesday night, Tom is going to take a little hiatus for a few weeks. I don't know how long it will take. And I'll begin presenting to you uh, a safety briefing of how to deal with the coming days. And we'll just spend some time looking in the scriptures. A great deal of it has to do with spiritual warfare. And we'll look at these things and we'll look at it from a way that is totally different from the way the charismania kind of put it out there. And so I want to encourage you to come. I don't know how many weeks it'll be, two, three, I don't know. We'll just take it a little at a time. But I want to make sure that this church, all of us, are equipped for what is coming. What did you hear today? What else did you hear today? The day of the Lord is coming. What else did you hear? Leave the stuff behind. Anything else? Keep going and somebody will listen. Very good. Is there anything else? Very good. It's more of him and less than us. Anything else? Amen. Don't waste your time on the ones who aren't listening. Is there anything else? Do all you can to save your family. Jesus is higher than everything. I... Believe in Jesus. Amen. As we sing, if you have an offering, you're welcome to worship Him with your offerings this morning.